and then how we under-acknowledge the negative impacts that such forces have on the rest of our lives as providers and as basically as humans. We set out doing a profession that we love. Nice blue sky day, lots of powder, nice mountains, some good friends, and only sometimes to end up blindsided by destructive forces of disenchantment, passion fatigue, burnout. Thankfully, pulling an empathy airbag can help both you and those around you. And this is so important because what we do really matters. Emergency work is demanding, it's chaotic, it's messy, it's at times tragic, it's at times comically hilarious. All in the span of one shift, you can go through all these emotions. It's real, it matters, and it's what we do. So with these thoughts in mind, the goals I'd like to talk to you about over the next 30 minutes or so are the following. is to recognize where we undervalue or underappreciate the destructive forces of, of, of lack of empathy and, and communication, and then relearn and sort of employ some of these techniques so that we can communicate better with our patients, enjoy our job more, communicate better with each other, and, uh, and you know, really make our lives better, I, I'd like to believe. So here again is another great question. Why is it me giving this talk? And here again, I'd like to blame Jim a little bit. I, because really, it was him and a few other St. Paul's Emerge docs 23 years ago now, when I was a med student going through this department, a little bit after this photo was taken, um, <clears throat> who demonstrated their gritty compassion in this beleaguered yet intimately caring environment. That helped compel me to make emergency medicine at St. Paul's a large part of my medical practice. Since med school and residency, I've worked as a family doctor in the North and Northwest Territories in Nunavut. And almost a year spent in a, in a small little hospital in the remote sort of Everest region of Nepal. I've worked with MSF a couple times with cholera and malnutrition. I spent a year teaching emergency medicine in Rwanda and then a few segments in Nepal for shorter periods of time. For the last 13 years or so, I've been as a staff at uh, Lionsgate Hospital Emergency Department as well as St. Paul's Hospital. And I'm into my seventh non-consecutive year um, as uh, one of the CFPCEM uh, program directors. This is the current team here, taking home gold last month from the National Conference uh, in Toronto in the Sim Olympiad. I've got some nice friends, some good colleagues. I have lovely kids, a nice family, a smarter than me physician spouse. Recently got a new rescue dog. And I've pulled my empathy airbag a few times, okay? I've been, had compassion fatigue, burnout, and I think that's why I'm here now, because I still love emergency medicine work, and I thought a lot about it, about why some of these things have happened to me. And I realize that mindfully communicating and empathetically caring for patients is inextricably linked to what we do and how we connect and conduct ourselves in the rest of our lives. It's all connected. And I'd like to show you why, okay? So it's always good to look at sort of what you are, what you're about. Merge work has got great variety. No two shifts are ever the same. There's a compelling immediacy. Even if the, even if the patient doesn't feel like this, or it's, even if it's not a true emergency, for the patient, it's a relative emergency. So everything is very compelling. It's fun being a decent diagnostician. You get to sort out hypoxemia, you can identify an overdose, you get to, to think about sniffing out a PE or an aortic dissection. And even for your headaches, you can put on like a cavernous venous sinus thrombosis for the weird headaches. You wear lots of different hats. Manage trauma, little palliative care hat sometimes, proceduralist hat. You do tests at the bedside or the chair side that you act on in real time. You get to see the young, the old, everything in between. You're not only responsible for taking care of a patient in the actual department, kind of behoove to actually help them on the outside too, set them up with outside resources, be it their stress test or their methadone clinic or their addiction clinic. There's a real sense of pride. You have a diverse skill set that you can actually handle pretty much anything that comes through the door, at least the first 10 minutes of it. You work as a really close-knit team, both in the eMERGE with all the other staff, the RTs and nurses, <clears throat> social work, unicor, everybody in there, but also as part of the hospital and then the community. Teamwork's important. 
you get to do shift work, which means you can go banking on Tuesdays and get your haircut on a Wednesday and then ski across Rogers Pass, you know, on any random Thursday without any other, anybody else around. You can do other jobs outside of the eMERGE work. Education, a lot of us participate in, and it's a very really important role that sort of goes beyond just seeing the patient. But in this room and in these departments that we all work in, there's people that are heavily involved in administration at the hospital level, the university level, government level, toxicologists, at the palliative care docs, uh, intensivists, uh, global and public health people. If you can't do any of those things, you can always sort of end up trying to be a program director. Most of the people we hang out with, as colleagues, friends, are really quite interesting. Some of them are a little weird, but most of the part, they're interesting. So like the fable of Rumpelstiltskin, though, there's always a catch, all right? No free lunch. One of the catches is shift work, yeah. You know, you miss birthdays, you work evenings and holidays, you miss some of that stuff. And also, every time you work a night shift, it's sort of akin to smoking one or two packs of cigarettes. That stuff adds up. You work in a fishbowl. Everyone sees your mistakes, sees where you overlook something, sees your messy clothes or your messy habits or your too tight trousers, your grumpy days. And then there's stress. All of medicine has stress. Just emerge is harder to control it. You can't turn it off at the beginning or move it out at the other side. And unfortunately, this idea, even though there's more and more to know and easier and easier access to get that information, you're still supposed to know everything. And we're still very rooted in a performance culture. You're only as good as your last save, your last procedure, and you're always as bad as your last miss or something you screwed up on. Because of the volume and because of the intensity, you've got to cut corners. And when you cut corners, you set yourself up for bad outcomes. All of medicine has bad outcomes. Just sometimes in eMERGE, people are a little bit sicker, and the bad outcome is slightly better. I know that's getting recorded, and that's poor English, but there you go. Um, more and more now we're forced to do more and more with less and less space and more and more demands on our time and on our, you know, pulling out our diagnosis. We have to chart more, we have to sit in front of a computer and click more. We need electronic records, that's the way of the future. But this transition to that is, is difficult and stressful. This month's magazine on, uh, from CMPA, the front cover is all about that. We then get a bunch of metrics that may or may not be helpful. This month's CM, or CGEM with uh, Rick Brucata and uh, I think it's Heather Murray debating the pros and cons of information you get back of how many CTs of the abdomens you order and how helpful is that is to, you know, to, to make you a better doctor. And then there's health risks. Potential for violence in eMERGE, sure. Potential to slip on a wet floor, sure, or get, you know, slip in the puke. Infection is there, there's a potential for getting infection. Thankfully, not uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers, but you might get scabies or bed bugs. But really, the real, real concern is the sort of more quietly destructive health risks sleep disorders, mood disorders, mental health stuff, addiction. And if we don't pay attention and reflect upon ourselves and our practice and our lives, this frog can end up getting boiled or burnt, or really, as emergency providers, burnt out. Okay? So burnout, compassion fatigue, what are these things? Well, academically speaking, they're a little bit distinctly different. From our, all, from our purposes, they're pretty much the same. Okay? But they focus on three pillars, feeling exhausted, overwhelming feelings of depersonalization, which includes you know, sort of cynical, sarcastic, jaded, lacking compassion or caring. And then the third pillar is feeling like what you're doing doesn't matter. What you're doing has no value or worth. There's a perceived lack of accomplishment. And this is all very measurable and has been since 1981 when Christina Maslick invented the burnout inventory. Since then, it's been put together to, to, for multiple disciplines. <clears throat> and the healthcare one is really quite interesting. I encourage you all to, not right now maybe, just, but um, later on, just pull it up on the internet and, and, and spend 15 minutes seeing how burnt out you are. What's clear if you look at the emergency medicine literature is that burnout is real, compassion fatigue is real, and it really disrupts our careers and our day-to-day -day at times, and it spreads out into the rest of our lives. The main thing it really does is it disconnects sort of our ability uh, to communicate with patients. If we lose that ability to communicate, 
you've lost that shared or that that uh, shared decision making skill that you have to have that therapeutic rapport that you develop with a patient. This study here on the bottom here from uh, it's Australia showed that 60% of emergency physicians are burnt out. That's a huge number. That's a lot of us in this room. So even if it's half that, it's still kind of significant. And it's very similar amongst emergency RNs as well, the literature. More recent study just last year, this one's from Spain, showed that empathy declines with burnout and results in a market, market emotional, behavioral, and cognitive changes in the emergency doc. Cognitive changes as well. Symptoms of alienation, helplessness, hopelessness, anxiety, depression are the most common. And the most common therapy or coping mechanism was drug use, usually alcohol. And then closely followed by poor lifestyle choices, exercise, sleep, nutrition, mood disorders. And then the resultant fallout had obvious detrimental effects on marital life and family life. And just in case you thought this wasn't happening near you, you can now thank the Barbic family for bringing us or exposing us our ugly underbelly. So Helena was a graduate student a few years ago that did her research here in Canada on burnout in emergency physicians. Her thesis is compelling reading, slightly harrowing actually, especially the part about extreme exercise as a coping mechanism being akin to a drug use disorder. Thankfully, she's publishing her paper first in Norwegian, so um, we can ignore it for the next few little while. Okay. Denial is not just a river in Egypt, apparently. Anyway, so why do we get burnt out? Well, because as physicians, we're trained to be all-knowing and infallible, okay? Because we're taught to accept and to solve problems and complaints that come to us, all of them. The elephant in the room is the cold, hard fact that not all of these problems we deal with have solutions, nor are we infallible. Semantics are important here as only true problems have solutions. They're clean math. Two plus two is four. So it's not surprising that clean problems in emergency medicine are really fun to deal with. Draining an abscess, reducing a shoulder. <clears throat> I love the, the radial head subluxation. Medically managing DKA. Those are fun because they're simple and they're, they have a solution. There's a problem with a solution, and you can see. But mostly, we're in the complex jungle of dilemmas. You got a patient with chronic renal failure. He's got a little bright red bud per rectum. He's on a DOAC. His left arm is numb. He can't see straight out of his right eye. He's feeling a little short of breath when he walks up the stairs. He's been recently fired from his family doctor's office. He needs some disability forms signed. His budgie needs feeding. His battery in the scooter is broken. You know, this is a dilemma. And dilemmas don't have pure solutions. And they require strategies. And we can't always see that. We want to fix stuff and make binary and clean decisions and plans. And when we can't, the frustration builds a rust on our compassion and our sense of utility and meaning. Multiple psychiatric studies have shown that when we try and numb out something unsavory or unfavorable or ugly in our lives and practice, we smother other positive emotions of hope, meaning, and courage. And this is what makes us burn out and lose compassion. So knowing these is hopefully knowing your enemy, like the famous Chinese general here. And here's also where the power of vulnerability can help. We must accept our dark corners and not numb them out. So Dr. Brown is the messiah in this area of research, really. If you haven't already, her TED Talk is another 20 minutes of homework you should do, and you should watch it. I think only 35 million people have already. And then you should probably bring some of that stuff into your practice. So basically, her research supports that by numbing the bad, we inadvertently suppress the good. So we must accept that we are imperfect, accept that we make mistakes, and accept that we can't always solve some of the many complex psychosocial and chaotic dilemmas that we have to deal with on every shift. Instead, what we can do is lean in and accept our imperfections, accept that we can't do it all, accept that we have to make a strategy. And the strategy to, to, to manage this really, simply, thankfully, lies in doing what we do best, which is seeing and taking care of patients in a way that we'd wish that a loved one would be cared for. Because how we care and how we interact with patients is vital, and it's what we truly, truly do. So think about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Caring for patients through interaction is our most commonly performed procedure, multiple times a day. Sometimes our work is about the big save, critical airway, the crucial, and the common procedure. These things are great, and we've got to be really good at them. They probably only account for 15 to 20% of what we do. So let's do some more math. 
say emergency department sees 80,000 people a year, 15 to 20% are the, as we described, the clean procedures. You admit another 20%. That still leaves almost 50,000 people coming to you for something else. What are they coming for? What are we providing? So somehow we develop you know, a relationship of healing through engagement and interaction with the patient. So as corny as this sounds, it sounds really corny, how we care for the patient, not just getting the facts, ordering the right tests, treating the pain, getting the consult, getting a consult, making a diagnosis. Actually, how we see the patient, the very act of caring in itself, stuff we do every day at the bedside or the chair side or standing in the waiting room, that is healing. That is what we do. And just by tra staying true to such an act of caring, we maintain our ability to connect. And this human-to-human -human connectedness is most likely the force that unites us as a species. Not to everyone, but as a whole. So the key to doing this lies in empathy. This is Mount Amadablan in the Kumbu Valley of Nepal. This is the great mother. And this is her arms outstretched, holding the Kumbu Valley and all of the Sherpa inhabitants in it in her embrace. So what is empathy? It's not sympathy. Sympathy is when you feel pity and fear and anger and frustration, and you're dragged down by that for the patient. It's not apathy, where you're sitting at the back, not caring. Remember, doing nothing is a choice as well. Empathy is simply just understanding the, other, the, emotion, or the experience and emotions of another. From a medical perspective, this, the description of empathy is a little bit more broad. But really unpacked is the ability to understand. Your attention, please. Would patient Helga Broda please return to Providence 7 Bravo? Would patient Helga Broda. You guys seen Helga? Please return to Providence 7 Bravo. Okay. Would patient Helga Broda please return to Providence 7 Bravo? Thank you. Okay. So hopefully Helga's somewhere fun. Um, so anyway, let's just go back on that, okay? So the medicalized de description of empathy is as such, but if you unpack it, it's really the ability to understand, communicate, act in a helpful and therapeutic way with the patient. And you've got to get it just right. Because if you're too sympathetic, you'd be rendered useless by the, all of the, the negative, we all know, all, all of the difficult things we see every day. Of course we know that this hurts, but we can't get stalled too much on that. We've got to help fix this problem. So you've got to get empathy just right, not too hard, not too soft, not too hot, not too cold. You've got to get empathy Goldilocks. And when you do, physicians who have empathy just right are smarter, richer, healthier, happier, have better patient outcomes, get sued less, and burn out less. So let's go through some of the little bit, little bit of the evidence. A lot of it comes from, from general practice. But there's some clear studies that show that when you go and see a family physician or you know, primary care with your diabetes, and, you, and that physician is empathetic, your hemoglobin A1C scores are lower. When you go see them for hypertension, you need less meds. When you go see them for your man cold, you get better faster. Same thing in the emergency medicine for suing, or for lit litiga in litigation. Empathetic physicians get sued less, even if they make as many mistakes. Just, you know, this is more recent. This was just last year. Asians are obviously more satisfied when they have an empathetic physician. So when you look at this paper a little bit more closely as well and think, you know, some of this might be a little bit soft and airy-fairy, but look who the second author is. It's Jeffrey Klein. Okay? He's into this. This works. He's put it on as well for his PE rule-out stuff. The more empathetic you are in seeing a patient with a potential PE, you're going to order the appropriate, the more likely are you going to order or not order the tests that you need or don't need. <laughs> empathetic physicians, empathetic nurses make the system better as well. This is a study from the well touted Journal of Patient Experience, I'm sure you've all read, um, that looks at hospital systems. Okay? They're less expensive to run and they're more efficient and effective. Interesting, if you look at the, where this most played out, the top two of the top three sort of most, most likely indicators to make, make the place better was communication and empathy. Notice that staff competence was way down there. 
So how do you measure empathy? Unfortunately, you don't get to use a cool machine like in Blade Runner, and you don't look for replicants. But there's some very well established tools, and most likely the one here is the Jefferson Empathy Scale. Empathy scale. Here again, it's been around for about a decade. It's been well validated, and it's been well validated across multiple disciplines. It's used in law schools, it's used in lawyers' offices, it's used for corporations, it's used um, in retail, um, commerce, nursing, medicine. Unfortunately, it's not been used for politics. <clears throat> um, here again is another interesting way to spend 20 minutes. What we know as well from empathy and measuring empathy in medical students is that it declines rapidly when you enter medical school. First, second, third year, your empathy starts to bottom out. Why is this so? Could not be really 100% sure, but quite, could be related to perhaps realizing that medicine is not super binary. It's not perfect. There's lots of gray areas. There's lots of dilemmas, not just problems that get solved. Perhaps it's related to siloed behaviors, shame-based learning, sleep debt, finances. Who knows? The other thing we don't know is where this line goes. You get spat out of medical school and then R3, your empathy is down here. What's happening to it? What's more scary is now when you superimpose this well-known happiness or well-being study. This is from the proceedings of the academic, uh, or sorry, of the National Academy of Science. This is 350,000 interviews. And the study has actually been subsequently looked at in 92 countries around the world and still shows the same U-shaped graph. And we career down into our early, mid-40s, early 50s on this tumble of discontent and, and unhappiness. And then only in sort of our late 40s, early 50s, do we start to get a bit happier. And this has been controlled for sex, for age, for finances, for race, for marital status. It's quite, quite interesting. So how to protect against this empathy erosion? We've talked a little bit about our own empathy, how we can lose that. We also have to acknowledge that there's macro systems that detract from empathy. Systems where we work. And this is also other evidence that's been well documented. If we work in systems of authority, we follow that authoritative lead. So there's multiple studies that show this. The Stanford Prison Study is one of the most famous ones for this. Students were put together and divided into two groups. One were prisoners, one were guards. Within days, the guards were abusing prisoners. So it's our nature. It had to be stopped early because of the danger there. Dogma, of course, we all know that. There was a time not very long ago that we thought residential schools were a good idea. We thought lobotomies were, were a good idea. We thought forced sterilization was a good idea. And really, what do, we, uh, what do we really feel about the relative hopelessness and ineffective care we provide those with homelessness and psychiatric illness and drug use disorders? It's going to be interesting to see how our current revolving door sort of policy of treating, streeting, will be judged through the lens of history uh, sometime in the near future. An in-group, out-group bias, tribal behaviors, of course we're tribal. It's eyes against patients coming in. It's emerge docs versus admitting docs. Fast docs versus slow docs. Docs that order too many CTs, you know, you know what I'm saying. So empathy gets drained both from a micro and a macro perspective. Thankfully, there's also really, really strong evidence that empathy is taught or is teachable. This is Dr. Hojat. She's a psychiatrist uh, from Philadelphia, and she helped invent her, the Jefferson Empathy Scale. So if you can measure it, you can teach it. And since then, there's been a move to put empathy training in some residency programs, mostly in the psychiatric and palliative care programs. This is one from New York. And Dr. Ruiz, I believe it is, who made this one. This is her app. Her main, one of her main points in, this, in, t in the teaching this course is that when we're faced with trying to explain something, that's what we do. We just keep explaining. We don't listen. We don't communicate. We just explain. We're an explainaholics. There's very little teaching or formal empathy teaching done in the emergency department or through in emergency medicine residency programs. This one is from 2000, uh, 2000 uh, in academic emergency medicine. And this program director made every new resident take a, a script or a, a, you know, a, a patient complaint, and 
you know, one was painful urination, another was an itchy armpit, you know, another was like too much flatulence. And they, I'm not sure exactly what they were, but they would then go to the emergency department and register as a patient, unbeknownst to the rest of the staff that were there. And they'd have to sit in the waiting room, get assessed, talk about their complaints in front of everyone else. And then the study ended when they're actually seen by a physician. There's some report that this was helpful. I don't know, a long time ago, I was a counselor in a camp for kids with just mental and physical disabilities. And we had to spend one day wearing depends that we only changed once. So it has some value. Here's another journal that I'm sure you've read, European Journal for Personal Center or Person-Centered Healthcare or Patient-Centered Healthcare. And these guys in the emergency department compared experience stories. So patients wrote their stories, nurses wrote their stories, RTs wrote their stories, physicians wrote their stories, and they all sat together and reviewed those stories and didn't really get that much more empathetic, but a little bit. I think if you're going to go that far, you're going to do it anyway. So mostly what we know about how to teach empathy comes from systemic reviews or, or some, a few meta-analyses, and they all focus on communication. Our communication style. So let's pretend that we're picking up a patient in our next shift, and you're going to wade through the waiting room, find this person, avoid the other stairs of patients wanting to be seen, and maybe step over some vomit, give someone a sandwich, find a space. What does that patient need from you? So the first step is you've got to satisfy the limbic system. Nonverbal communication is deeply, deeply rooted in the reptilian parts of our brain. So for the patient to trust the physician or the nurse who's taking care of them, they're only going to do that once they've completed an environmental, environmental scan and decided if it's safe. And what are they checking for? Well, it's the nonverbal elements of communication that dominate. What is said accounts for less than 10%. It's more how it is said and what the body language is like when it's been said. There's a huge power differential between patients and emergency care providers. That has to be balanced for that limbic system to be satisfied. So you've got to work, think about that. How do you do that? Well, a lot of it's how you look. If you come to a patient and go, why are you here, standing over them with your arms crossed, it's much less opening and welcoming, then, hey, how can we help? What's going on? Appropriate eye contact, appropriate smile, if it's appropriate. <laughs> and then how and what you speak. Don't look rushed. Thank them for waiting. Apologize for the wait. And then try asking a question that the first, or try asking a question that's not, why are you here? Even if it's meant genuinely, it's often interpreted as a judgmental statement. Hey, I can see you've had a rough day. How can we help? Are better questions. And don't say this to the patient. Say this to yourself. Sit down and shut up. Because it matters. When you sit, maybe not if there's melina or bed bugs, but pull up a stool then. So it's either sit on the bed or a stool, or failing that, just get down to eye level. And that settles. Patients who have physicians that sit feel like that physician has spent way longer with them, even if they hadn't, or even if they spent less time than if they were standing. And then be quiet. Try not to interrupt for 25, 30 seconds. A study 10 years ago showed that we interrupt every 18 seconds. A study a year ago shows that we interrupt every 11 seconds. So we're getting worse. If you can let the patient talk for 20 to 50 seconds, they are way more, feel like you get it, way more. So sit down, shut up, and while you're shutting up and listening and sitting down, figure out their context. This is what you have to do. Who are they? Why are they here? Why are they here today with this problem that's several hours, several days, several weeks old? You know this. Why today? What about today? Figure it out. What facilities do they have mentally, financially, socially? What are they afraid of, pain for, worried about? What is ailing them? You know, you're going to find stuff out. What kind of work do they do? Why are they here today? It's such a basic question, but the real, it's a real root of figuring out what, what about their problem, what they're worried about. Well, my neighbor had chest pain last week, and then he died. And that's why I'm worried about this chest pain now. So put on your primary survey your ability to establish emergency rapport. And then put on your empathy cloak 
and wade in with this discussion. This works well with spouses as well, with your parents. And listen, so first thing, sit, shut up, then listen. And listen actively. Yeah, okay, nod a little. Hmm, throw in a few grunts. Or yeah, okay. And then get their context. We sort of talked about that, but that's so important. Then validate. Okay, you had chest pain and your neighbor died recently with chest pain. I can see that's really scary. That's why you must be really worried. And then set a plan and expectations. Hey, so look, it's really busy. I know we're in the waiting room. The guy's barfing beside you. We may not be able to figure out exactly what's causing your chest pain, but I'm worried a little bit about a pulmonary embolus and maybe an acute coronary syndrome. So we're going to do some tests. It's going to be a couple of hours. Someone's going to come and start an IV. They're going to give you some contrast and take you off to the, the scanner. You let us know if you have more pain, and then you and I are going to chat again once you're back, probably about an hour and a half, OK? Do you have any questions? That's empathetic. That doesn't take that much longer, and that's, that's what you do when you have your cloak on. Some useful phrases that you can uh, carry around with you that are, if you're near the end of your shift or you can't quite think of things, is, hey, tell me more about this. What happened? That shows that you're engaged, you're caring, you're listening. Or just acknowledge them. You seem really frustrated or angry or sad or scared. Help me understand what's different about your mom today. Help me understand what made you bring her today. What's your biggest fear? What are you worried about? What are you most scared for? Okay. And then step back at some point while you're sitting with this patient and just see yourself talking to them. See it, the interview through their eyes. They want to know from you. Are you listening? Do you care? Are you going to get it right? Do you understand? So how to get to this reflective Nirvana-like practice? It can be really hard sometimes. And this is a huge part of the empathy training, being able to reflect on what is pissing you off and what is getting in your way for caring for the patient. And here is where some mindfulness can help. For the billion-dollar mindfulness industry, there was Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl is a psychiatrist, or was a psychiatrist who survived a con the concentration camp of the Second World War and lived till the late 1990s and became quite a, a writer and a speaker. He wrote a book that is very thin. It will take you more than 20 minutes to read, but it's also a valuable read called Man's Search for Meaning. <clears throat> and really how he survived, is how he claimed anyway, is with this, with choosing his response. Between stimulus and response, there's a space, and it's within that space that we choose our response. That's the power. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And this is that this space is what Buddhists call heartscape or vipassana, non-judgmental awareness. Seeing your thoughts, seeing your reaction, or seeing your stimulus before you react. That's having that space. It takes practice. Meditation can help being quiet, riding your bike on trails, or climbing routes, or skiing, painting stuff, building stuff, standing on one's head. However, it works. You just generating some mindfulness can really help. Generating a little pause between what stimulates you or what gets, comes to you and how you react to it can be really helpful. So take some mindfulness to work. So that includes getting yourself ready to get the most from your work knowing your triggers, and reacting within control. Remember, this is what you chose to do. The good, the bad, the full catastrophe of emergency medicine. So accept and embrace this fact. Another little thing that's been shown to help is hearing thanks. So the next time you're seeing a patient, just before you pull back the curtain or walk away from their chair at the, in the waiting room or close the door, just Pause slightly, not uncomfortably, but just for one or two seconds. Once in a while, there's a fuck off. But most of the time, there's actually some form of thanks. Don't brush it off. Because that thanks actually turns into the positive feedback cycle of your well-being. So I've presented some of the evidence for compassion fatigue and burnout issues as we face as eMERGE providers. I've also reviewed some of the proven strategies to help mitigate some of those stuff, especially the negative things. But please don't just take it from me, okay? 
try on your next shift some of this stuff out and see for yourself. Practice it a little bit. See if it works. If it doesn't, that's, that's OK. But this stuff has been shown to be helpful. So a couple little bits of homework, other than the four times 20 minutes of reading or watching that I've given you already, is on your next patient, try and figure out what the color of their eyes are. Why is that important? Well, it shows that you've actually looked at them and you've considered them. Ask your learner what color their eyes are. That'll throw them off. But it just shows that you've actually made a connection, that eye contact. The next thing you should try and do is throw in an empathetic statement. Wow, that must be hilarious, or that must be uncomfortable when your rectum's exposed like that. You know, something like that, okay? And then, like we talked about, try hearing the thanks and actually really hearing it, putting it in to positively churn through that feedback cycle. Because accepting honest praise and thanks for what you do is not just vanity, okay? It makes you, your colleagues, your workplace, and your life better. So in summary, we've talked a little bit about burnout and compassion and realize that they're both real and dangerous. We now know that empathy can be very measured and taught, and we probably don't teach it enough. And empathy makes the care you deliver simply better. So thank you. Simon, excellent presentation. Um, I have a question, though, with regards to the empathy training that you mentioned that has been in trialed at one or two residency programs. Is there a thought that that is something that's coming down the pipeline from either the College of Family Physicians or the Royal College with regards to the new sort of competency-based curriculum and sort of a, a national approach, or is this just sort of a one program trying it at a time type thing? So the studies that I described, uh, residency programs um, using or employing formal empathy training were from America and Australia. I don't know of any formal competency-based education initiatives for empathy in Canadian residency programs as yet, which doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't. Matthew? And maybe you can just add a little something. In family medicine, when we do our final exams, we have to ask about the feelings, interests, and fears of the patient. Otherwise, you don't pass your exam. So there's a lot of things that are towards empathy in our exam for us to pass. So what Matthew is referring to is fifing a patient, asking about their fears, their insights, their, what's the other F? Feelings and expectations. It's not quite empathy, but it's, it's, you know, it's understanding context a little and understanding their illness experience. Yes, Eric. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, if I wear my administrator hat a little bit, I, I wonder, are there, are there places that have looked to prevent or to protect ph physicians from themselves? Because it strikes me that, you know, some of the reason why we burn out is because we work, you know, 18 shifts in a month or we do three jobs or whatever. So, we used to do that at St. Paul's, actually. We used to say that there was a limit to how many shifts you could work in a row and a whole bunch of things. And I just wonder if, if anybody has done that and what their experience is. So here again, it makes intuitive sense to say, like, if you work more and see more patients and eat less and sleep less and try and cut more corners and try and solve more dilemmas that aren't solvable, you're going to get more and more frustrated. That makes sense. Probably what's not helpful is saying you can only work 14 shifts because if you work 15, that's what will happen. It's probably better, and it falls in the same category as some of the metrics that we get from uh, how we see patients and what we do with patients, is or how, can you, how can we support physicians and nurses who are caring for patients better to do their job? And physicians can decide the number of shifts or the number of tests they need to do to do their job properly and helpfully. And 
here, again, I think it's fairly helpful or useful that physicians are aware of some of these negative forces that come with trying to solve dilemmas as problems. So, again, I think that makes total sense. Has anybody looked at the relationship between physicians who work harder and physicians who work less hard? Or, or okay, I see what you're saying now. Yeah, so that, no, I don't, not that, I did not come across that. Um, that study that Klein was the second author on that looked at empathy and patient satisfaction, or empathy on emerged physicians and patient satisfaction, you know, you could probably till that out of that quite easily by those empathetic physicians. How, you know, are they working four shifts a month, you know, and getting massages right afterwards, or are they, you know, so. Yes, Jim. Thank you, Simon. I knew I was right when I convinced you to give this talk. <laughs> um, I, I think a hard part of what you're talking about that really seems to be important to me is um, is that this relates to get to trying to understand yourself and and how you um, interact. And one thing that struck me when, when Jeff Klein gave his talk at Cape was about how physicians are different. And they had this study where they gave a story and they tried to make diagnosis. And their patients with pulmonary embolism is what he was doing. And then they had videos of the patients. And they actually forced the physician, a group of physicians to actually then watch the patient very carefully give the story and to see how much better they were at making the diagnosis. And um, But what was interesting to me was that what they found was that there are three groups of physicians. Some absolutely loved it and did a much better job. Some people, yeah, and it um, it didn't really make too much difference. And some, a third of the physicians were quite uncomfortable, mm. which I thought was very interesting, trying to really connect and trying to really watch carefully the patient, the facial expressions, and doing all that sort of stuff. So I think we're a wide range of, of, of who we are. Our strategies might be a bit different to learn about doing this, but I'm hoping that no matter where you are in that spectrum, that it's possible improve your empathy because, as you said, the bottom line is it's important for you and your health and also for your patients and their care. Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, so this is a question from Riyadh online. Okay. So thank you, Riyadh. The question was, um, if I just paraphrase it slightly, is, is in what context are endurance sports, um, what's, how did he exactly say it? Uh, as, a form of as a form of addiction, or a, a dysfunctional addiction. So please um, take out the dysfunction, um, because they're coping mechanisms, and, as a, and they're tools. So doing stuff, that, or sorry, it, it goes back to, to why we do things. So if, if we're doing, if we're running for six hours, trying to numb something out, that's far more dysfunctional than if we're running for six hours, trying to create space and reclaim space in our thinking so that we can see things from a bigger perspective. So it's all in how we, how we approach it. And that speaks a bit to Jim's point is we all, have different methods of coping and dealing, but being aware of how these things can build up as rust if we don't deal with them, and how we can, how we damp down or try to numb out things we don't like, we also, we also crush some of the things that bring us joy and happiness and, and power and energy. So it all depends on how, we all, we're all gonna use these, these modalities of, uh, I don't really wanna call them therapy, but that's the word that's coming to my mind right now, in our own way, but if we do it in a way that we, why we, or we, if we understand why we're doing it, I think is the key. Does that make sense? Yes, Sean. Can I add something? Okay, somebody's talking. Sean, can you hold on just for whoever's, who is Yes, that? from Vancouver, Vancouver Island. Uh, my name is Dr. Jason Whale. I'm one of the uh, attendings over here. Um, first of all, thank you for the talk. I'm of a very similar vintage to you, and I have a similar perspective. I wanted to answer one of the questions that came from your audience earlier. About three years ago, I did a survey on Vancouver Island of 120 Emerge docks looking at burnout. I had a return rate of about 98 docks. And we embedded the, uh, the Maslach burnout inventory into a series of other questions to see what correlations uh, w correlated best to physicians that were burnt out. 
And with respect to the question of uh, number of shifts worked or hours worked and burnout, it did correlate directly with one of the three Maslach uh, burnout inventories, which was cynicism and depersonalization, mm -hmm. but not with emotional exhaustion and not with sort of sense of personal efficacy. And the other thing that I discovered over the course of that work was that looking at um, behavioral economists, when they look at all jobs, including medicine, the things that are most protective from burnout that make people satisfied in their work are having autonomy of work, positive feedback for work well done, and the third thing is a sense of meaning. And I think when you're talking about um, um, all the empathy, it's really generating meaning back into the work. And what I witness in the residents I see is that they come into the program and the technical side of the job is the groove that they like and they get really excited about and they're happy for a while. Almost after graduation, when they've kind of mastered a lot of that stuff, there's a bit of a dip in job satisfaction. I think it's because that empathy portion has been lost and the meaning of the job has been lost. And so I really uh, appreciate you giving this talk today. <clears throat> Thank you. That's a really valuable contribution, actually. Sean. Uh, so thanks, Simon, for a great talk. Um, I'm uh, neither at St. Paul's right now or on a merge, so this doesn't really apply to our group here. Um, but um, I was in a situation recently where uh, I really reflected on some disillusionment that I was feeling about some of the things that you touched on. Uh, I was in a situation where um, there were staff positions and some higher level learners um, that were kind of talking in a way and having dialogues privately were with our group uh, in a way that reflected um, not just a sort of sense of maybe empathy, fatigue, or burnout, um, but almost kind of verged on, um, I don't know, I, I wouldn't call it ill will or anything like that, but it was uncomfortable. Uh, and it made me kind of go through this experience of, as I said, disillusionment after the fact. Uh, and when it was going on, like, I, I know all of the, you know, we, we talk about all of the kind of factors that can contribute to this. While it was going on, I was, like, entertaining fantasies of bravely challenging them and, you know, uh, holding them to account for all this stuff, but I didn't. And I was wondering what you would do about this kind of culture that sometimes reinforces these uh, kinds of sentiments. And, you know, do you keep to yourself? Do you focus on yourself? Do you challenge people? Do you try to be the change? Like, what, how would you reckon with that kind of thing? I want to say something totally inappropriate, but this is being recorded, so I will not. Thank you for the question. Um, and this touches on some of the other questions or comments that have already come through. All you can control is your response. So that stimulus and that response and that space. So you have to be that change. And you have to decide, is this something that people will take input on right now, or is this something that I will need to model or a behavior that, you know, model a, a more appropriate behavior and come back to this at another time? What you're also saying to me, or, or illustrating, is that there, there's, you know, su supporting that there's huge macro detractions to empathy in the systems that we work on a daily basis. And that can be even more, and it can be very dangerous, especially when there's learners involved. They're staff modeling that behavior. So that's a concern. But you have to pick your battles, and you have to control what you do. That's really all you can really, really do. Yes, Jim. Great, great question and great response, Simon. Um, there's, uh, in, in trying to change the, the system, it's, it's going to be slow, and these kinds of talks are really critical. The Faculty of Medicine right now, with the heads of the departments, is having discussions about how we change the culture to have a more appropriate learning environment for our learners within the Faculty of Medicine. And it's triggered by UBC having the highest rate of reported mistreatment or maltreatment of students by staff in the country. Wow. <clears throat> And, but it's more than that, right? And it's, you can question the way they get the information and all that kind of stuff, but it is a terrible kind of thing. But the recognition is that what it means is there's a whole culture that we have to change, and we only change that by trying to model what would be a better approach. And I think this is a piece that I hadn't thought about before that we need to sort of work into that. So there's going to be a group at the f higher level of the of leaders in the faculty of medicine trying to figure out how we can promote a better culture and a learning environment. And I'm going to try to offer that this is going to be a really important piece to people to understand that 
are having those kinds of dis inappropriate discussions that they, they can actually feel better by doing something different and then everybody else feels better around them. Yes, Chris. I'm trusting you're moderating this, Jim, because I'm aware of not, I don't have a watch on. So uh, just, just with that whole concept, we have a lack of, of advocacy for uh, dissension sort of from standardized medical protocol or in these types of learning groups. So if an individual comes out who's a learner, who's reasonably fresh to the medical field and hasn't quite been hammered into the correct peg yet, um, when they have a dissenting view, it's not adequately supported. So in this kind of situation, why do you